Welcome everybody to this uh, uh, center stage virtual workshop on applying the women's empowerment principles in the tourism, tourism sector. My name is Ben Owen. I'm the project manager for the center stage project, which aims to put the women's empowerment at the center of the COVID-19 tourism recovery. Um, I'd like to first of all thank our, our good partners, the um, German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, as well as the German Agency for International Cooperation, GIZ, and of course, <clears throat> UN Women, with whom we are co-hosting and co-organizing today's uh, workshop. We're very pleased uh, for all of the support. Now, as part of the Center Stage project, UNWTO is organizing a series of virtual workshops. Today is uh, we're very pleased to see so many people connected. Thank you for being with us, as well to all of you watching back on YouTube. Uh, today is focused at the private sector, so applying the women's empowerment principles. And without further ado, I'd like to give the floor back to Lucy uh, and to our colleagues uh, for the fantastic presentations that everyone's prepared. So we do hope today will be useful and, uh, and many people will be watching back. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much for being with us today for sharing your precious time with us. We shared with you in advance the, the principles, the, uh, the, the gender inclusive principles for the private sector, which have recently, very recently been published. We hope you've had a chance to read those. If not, we can look at them quickly here together. I just ask you as my means of an introduction to write your name, your company and location in the chat so we can see who we have here. Thank you to Anna Fout, UN Women New York, Michaela Connor from Discover DMC, located in Phuket, but looking after 11 countries in Asia. Fien Kagla from Cloud7, Cloud7 Residence, Ayla Akaba, Jordan. So please continue to put in the chat uh, your name and where you're working from and your company. As you know, the aims of this workshop are to support private sector companies to, in tourism to identify concrete actions for putting into practice your commitments to gender equality and women's empowerment. We hope that at the end of this workshop, you will uh, understand the WEPs, the Women's Empowerment Principles, if you don't already know those, and how they're relevant to the tourism sector. You will know how to conduct a self-assessment of your own progress on gender equality, be able to identify key measures and actions to implement the WEPs and be aware of some available support for your WEPs journey. Thank you very much to those who are continuing to write in the chat. Rama Mahendru from Intrepid Travel based in New Delhi, Senin Kara, Moven Pick Hotels and Resorts in the Dead Sea, Jordan. Welcome to everyone. Today, I'd like to present to you very quickly the gender inclusive strategy for tourism businesses, which you already have access to. I'm not going to take too much time with that because I'll be very keen to pass on to our two presenters who are with us today from UN Women. We have Jocelyn Chu, she's Programme Specialist Consultant in the Economic Empowerment section of UN Women and author of a very recently published paper. Jocelyn, congratulations, Procurement Strategic Value why gender responsive procurement makes business sense. And this is a particularly key issue for the tourism sector in terms of procurement and the massive potential of the sector to contribute to women's economic empowerment through procurement. So I'm really pleased that you're with us today, Jocelyn, to talk on this emerging topic that companies often have many questions about how to implement. And then we will have Anna Felt, who's the head of the Women's Economic Empowerment Principles for UN Women. Very happy to have Anna with us today. And she'll be talking about some practical guidelines on how to apply the WEPs particularly for you in the tourism sector. Then we will move on to those group discussions, which, as I said, will not be recorded. These discussions will also be moderated, so you'll have to work through the chats and your, your own discussions and conversations. And then we'll come back together and we will uh, record again for those watching on YouTube who I'd like to also give a big welcome to. That welcome again as also to Mohamed Khad, Egi Lire, Luxury Travel Concierge and Lifestyle Management co Company in Egypt, welcome. And Sinam Hijazin from Hayat Regency, Aqaba Isla Resort. So welcome to you. And also welcome to those of us who are watching on YouTube. So I'm going to pass over now to Jocelyn. 
Welcome, Jocelyn, and thank you so much for being with us today. I will share your slides now. Thank you, Lucy, and thanks for having me today. I'm very happy to be here. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, as mentioned, uh, the Economic Empowerment Section uh, of U of Women just published the report, Procurement Strategic Value, Why Gender Responsive Procurement Makes Business Sense. The report pre presents the evidence-based business case for gender responsive procurement um, and finds that through gender responsive procurement or GRP, that the private sector, including the tourism industry, can empower women while also strengthening and bettering their business, particularly in today's uncertain global environment. <laughs> now, for those unfamiliar, gender responsive procurement or GRP refers to the sustainable selection of services, goods, or public works from women-owned or women-led enterprises and or those having gender responsive policies and practices for employees and supply chains. Gender responsive procurement is part of principle five of the women's empowerment principles, which Anna will speak about later on. And principle, principle five focuses on implementing supply chain and marketing practices that empower women. GRP is also promoted in the recently published report, a Gender Inclusive Strategy for Tourism Businesses, which as you've seen, if you took a look at it uh, before this webinar today, names GRP as a priority action to promote entrepreneurship and increase the number of women-owned businesses in the supply chain. Now, before moving on to more about you and women's research and uh, publication, um, procurement's strategic value. I'd like to mention that the report was made possible by our donors, NAMA Women Advancement and Mary Kay. Uh, the report is a product of the Women's Entrepreneurship Accelerator, uh, which is an initiative convening six UN agencies and Mary Kay for women's entrepreneurship. And the report is also a contribution to our flagship program, stimulating equal opportunities for women entrepreneurs. And the program takes a systems approach and utilizes gender responsive procurement as a strategic lever for change based on the idea that governments, organizations, and businesses big and small can accelerate gender equality and women's empowerment by sourcing from women's enterprises and gender responsive enterprises. Now, importantly, our flagship program scales up and contributes to you and women's work across multiple countries and geographical regions. We've been promoting gender responsive procurement since our founding in 2010. And in fact, between 2018 to 2021, we supported over 1000 governmental entities, companies and international organizations to develop uh, or implement gender responsive procurement policies. Now with that background, I'd like to move on to the basis for this work, the basis for the publication followed by how we did it, uh, the methodology, and I'll conclude with our findings. Now, first of all, for the purpose, we decided to take on this work because of the private sector's large potential to impact gender equality and women's empowerment. So globally, you may be aware that one in three businesses are owned by women, but women only win an estimated 1% of the procurement spend of large corporations. Now, this is a huge missed opportunity because the private sector spends trillions in procurement. Uh, and in fact, procurement spend contributes to 72% of GDP in OECD countries. Now, knowing this huge potential in procurement, we aim to create a convincing advocacy tool to amplify and strengthen our advocacy on GRP or gender responsive procurement. We also heard that stakeholders were looking for examples of what companies were doing and what they were seeing as a result. So in other words, our advocacy on GRP needed to be undergirded by an evidence-based business case, and we're happy that this is what that publication is. Now, moving on to the methodology um, of the research uh, that, uh, that the publication rests on. Um, we, uh, the methodology actually is detailed in the annex of the report, and I will um, put, a, put a hyperlink uh, of the report later on in the chat for your reference. Um, but I'll just go over a few key things here as well. So along with desk research, we engaged over 350 stakeholders 
for this report, and this was done uh, in a few different ways. First, we created uh, a community of practice with a focus on the private sector, where companies presented their GRP and supplier diversity journeys. This took the form of three webinars and it included interactive sessions to hear more about uh, GRP uh, practitioners and other stakeholders. And companies also shared why and how they started GRP, how they overcame challenges and the results seen. We also interviewed over 50 stakeholders, the majority of whom were procurement professionals to learn in more detail um, what companies are doing and importantly, the, the benefits that they're deriving for more inclusive procurement practices. And finally, we created and disseminated a survey on GRP and that received around 70 responses from the private sector. So now moving on to the next slide. Thanks, Lucy. We found that six main themes emerged from this um, massive body of research. So first, companies practicing GRP benefited from increased revenue and reduced procurement spend. And this is due to a broader range of suppliers from gender responsive procurement, many of which became customers of the business itself. Secondly, companies practicing GRP saw greater supplier availability and resilience. Now this is an important and key finding due to the global supply chain issues that we're seeing now. Third, GRP strengthened companies' brand satisfaction across a wide range of stakeholders, including customers, peers, investors, and employees. And this all increases business and brand loyalty. We also found that GRP is correlated with more innovation and adaptability. And GRP can also improve service delivery. And what we mean by that is that um, companies saw increases in efficiency, customer service, and productivity, primarily due to the influx of new diverse talent from GRP. Now, lastly, by practicing GRP, companies contribute uh, to strengthening markets through economic development and inclusive growth. And this leads to new and expanding opportunities for the businesses themselves. These six main findings are presented in the six chapters of the report, uh, which are accompanied by case studies. The case studies highlight different companies' journeys, including how they began GRP uh, or gender responsive procurement, how they overcame challenges and what results they saw from their initiatives. Now, as you can see on the slide, we uh, feature seven case studies from nine different companies across North America, Latin America, and Africa in the report. We prioritize case studies in our research because stories resonate more than facts uh, and are sometimes more remembered. Uh, so what I'll do now is to pique your interest, I'll just highlight a few of the case studies, but um, I encourage you to, to check out the publication um, later on. Um, the first case study I'll highlight is from the Gulf African Bank. Now, before taking on GRP, uh, their women's banking segment wasn't profitable. Uh, but after increasing their spend with women-owned businesses, the segment now contributes to about 25% of its assets and liabilities. We also have Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, which like many companies made a mad scramble for uh, personal protective equipment or PPE at the start of the pandemic in 2020. And in the end, it was their supplier diversity efforts and their network that allowed them to find that personal protective equipment, PPE, and uh, they were able to continue their operations uh, in 2020. The last case study I'll highlight is from the fashion brand Ghani. Ghani, after signing the, the WEPS, the Women's Empowerment Principles, aimed to have 100% traceability in tiers one, two, and three of their supply chain. Uh, by 2021, and now they actually have uh, geographical traceability in all four tiers. And because of these efforts, Ghani has differentiated itself in a crowded field, uh, and the efforts contributed to customer and employee satisfaction. Because of their efforts, the company has experienced con uh, continued growth, even during the pandemic, um, and they attribute this to living their values through gender-responsive procurement and other initiatives. 
So like I said, I hope you'll check out the publication uh, and feel free to reach out with any questions uh, and uh, or to join our community of practice on gender responsive procurement. I'll dr drop the link uh, for the publication uh, and my email in the chat uh, in case you'd like to reach out. And with that, uh, thank you everyone for listening and Lucy, back to you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for being with us today and such an interesting presentation. I hope you all get a chance to read the report and think about how it can be applied in the tourism sector. So I will swiftly pass over to Anna. Anna, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and I'm going to share my uh, screen. So please let me know if you can see it. <clears throat> Can you see it? Yes, great. Um, I will launch it and hopefully you'll still see it. Is that good? Great. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Felt. I'm uh, leading the Women's Empowerment Principles Initiative from UN Women in New York. And uh, it's been a little bit more than 10 years since, since we launched the Women's Empowerment Principles together with the UN Global Compact. The community has grown <clears throat> and we are today up to about 6,600 companies across 150 countries that have made a commitment to gender equality and women's empowerment. And why does this matter? Today, it matters because there are a lot of stakeholders that are looking to companies on how responsible contact they have, whether it's in the environmental field, whether it's in the social and inclusion field, uh, there is an increasing uh, pressure on companies actually to be more responsible uh, towards the, the social and economic pillars uh, of sustainable development goals. And we see consumers uh, looking more to have uh, an um, the, when they choose to go on vacation or they choose to select a, a product, whether it is a hotel or airline, they are more conscious. Of course, price matters, but they are more conscious about what uh, products and services they choose. Investors are also extremely, um, and we get emails from them every week asking uh, for companies that are um, having a, a great um, track record of how they're acting in the market from a responsibility perspective. We have um, talent that are, are looking more carefully to make sure that they're choosing the company that aligns with their values. So there's a lot of pressure <clears throat> and the women's empowerment principles have give you an opportunity to understand what, what, what they're asking for and what is in their minds uh, from all these different stakeholders. So we have these seven uh, principles and they're focusing both on workplace. So workplace are the internal issues. Marketplace are a little bit what we heard uh, Jocelyn talking about gender responsive procurement, but also focusing on um, marketing and advertising. And then we have engagement in local communities and the seventh focus on um, reporting and, and making sure that you are on, on track. So I will walk you through these seven principles and give some examples uh, that might be useful for your discussion in the working groups later on. So um, the, the first principle is about high level corporate uh, leadership. And what we've seen, it matters when the CEO of the company makes this commitment to the women's empowerment principles, um, because the, the leader of the company set the tone for what, what will come next. Um, and um, how seriously these issues will be um, taken uh, by, by the company. So it's very, very important. And it's, it goes then from the CEO's commitment it goes to how the business values, the, the business plan is being set up, and the organizational culture uh, trickles down from, from this commitment. Um, and we encourage all companies to set uh, company-wide goals and targets and um, make the managers accountable for results. And we see the big bottleneck is actually at the middle management, those that are implementing this commitment from the senior team. Um, 
And um, that's where most of the efforts need to go to focus on the middle management to make sure that um, there are new ways of working and uh, that those new ways of working is actually working out. And, and we heard from um, Jocelyn about gender responsive procurement. Procurement is an area that is quite tricky to, to change habits and, and um, um, it requires um, quite um, a strong accountability framework to, to make that happen at the middle management level. Um, so the principle two is about play, uh, leveling the playing field for women and men. And we know very much in the service industry, um, including the tourism industry, that they're quite uh, distinct roles. This is a woman's job. This is a man's job. But this is an opportunity to look at it in a much broader perspective and say, let's make it possible for women and men, no matter the interest, no matter their expertise, that they can contribute to the company. So it is about looking at uh, outside the box to find solutions. Um, I have a little airplane here because um, we have a good example from an airline that really went above um, and outside the box to find a solution. They were looking to uh, hire 50, 50 women and men pilots, and they couldn't find enough candidates, uh, women candidates, to fill the 50% of, of their pool of, of pilots. Uh, they bought uh, three simulators uh, and put these women, there was a requirement of having 250 hour flight hours and to help women um, uh, give, be given those opportunities, they, uh, the women had to sit for those 250 hours in, in the simulators. And with those um, hours, they were able to uh, become co-pilots and eventually pilots. So this was a good way to think outside the box. If you don't find, think what, what the solutions can be. Um, and it is about, um, as I mentioned earlier, thinking through and remove the segregation and stereotypes. Why would um, the cleaning personnel in a hotel only have to be women? Um, very often uh, we see a lot of women, but why does it have to be like that? Uh, why does it have to be that often the, um, the hotel manager is, is a man? So thinking outside the, the box and really think through what roles, um, how to overcome those uh, segregation and stereotypes on what is a woman and, and man's job, for example. And a way to, to help with that is to look at flexible working arrangements, to think about, is there a way, if there's a responsibility in the particular country where you are, that um, for parents to bring the children to school, uh, to actually change the hours of the shifts in the company to start so that the parents have time to drop off the children at school and then come to work. So not uh, start the shift during those hours, for example. And um, giving that opportunity for both parents, uh, women, uh, mothers and fathers, uh, to be able to share that role would also help to level the playing field for women, uh, that they are not um, constrained by uh, the hours of school or, or other activities with uh, their care responsibilities. Um, principle three is about health, safety, and well-being. And uh, it's very important both from a physical and emotional health to take this, this into consideration. And we saw that very much during the COVID pandemic, uh, an increase in domestic violence um, and uh, in general, this kind of level of frustration and employers play a very important role. And they also impacted by the fact when em employees are not healthy and happy, they are also suffering. There are less uh, productivity, more absenteeism, et cetera. So it does make a, a, a big difference uh, when employers step in and, and support their employees. And, um, it's important also to help with, with the prevention. And um, I think in, in the service sector, uh, there are particular concerns with violence and harassment, et cetera, to, to really take that to heart and, and think through 
not only from uh, the, the company's perspective, what I just mentioned with absenteeism and productivity, but also in terms of retention. If the employees feel cared for and, and that there's an empathetic um, approach from the company, they will also stay. And the investment that the company has made in the employee will uh, help uh, to retain the talent. Um, and uh, it's of course very important and we hear from many companies that in some countries and some communities, uh, there is an issue of safety and security to come to work and go home from work. And that often they have to provide buses to make sure that it's safe for everyone to come and, and from and to work. So there are many opportunities to, to help uh, when, when they might not be safe around the workplace. Um, uh, we can share the slides uh, afterwards. I'm, I'm running through just to give you some ideas um, for what you can talk about in, in the uh, working groups later. Uh, principle four is about education and training. And this is also an opportunity to then help um, what I talked about earlier, the segregation and stereotypes on what is a woman's job and a man's job. This is an opportunity to also invest in taking the really great talent in one area and help them transition into another area of the company, whether it is uh, to become a manager or whether it is to change the, the type of, of role that the employees have and uh, maybe look into having some of the uh, hotel personnel go into the corporate and, and do other type of work that is non-traditionally women's job or men's job, for example. But it's also about raising awareness of, of the employees when it comes to gender equality, to inclusion uh, and, and uh, bring about what the company stands for, the values, and make sure that that trickles down to all employees and that they understand the commitment that the company has made to diversity inclusion, that it trickles down to everyone in the company and, and because they are representatives, particularly in the service industry, they are a representative of the brand and representative of what the company stands for. Uh, to have that training and include that uh, gender equality aspect into to that training. It's also about um, bringing in um, and, and the men into the equation to, uh, for them to also understand what, what is the terminology to talk about this so that they also can um, talk about these issues of gender equality and women's empowerment and not feel that they are shy because they don't have the right terminology and, and, and the words to use. So we have in, in UN Women, we are running barbershops specifically for men to talk about these issues and their concerns and um, with, with the work on, on gender equality. Um, but it also includes um, training on, on sexual harassment. What does that mean? Both from, from the, um, um, the ones that are sexually harassing people, but also from the recipient end to understand what that means and what is acceptable and non-acceptable. Uh, particularly as um, the, the employees that are working uh, front end with customers uh, and, and with the clients, how, uh, what is acceptable to, uh, from the client and what is not and where, where can the, the, the foot be uh, um, put down and, and say, no, this is unacceptable behavior. So from both sides, um, this is the training. Uh, principle five, uh, we heard um, Jocelyn talk about gender responsive procurement, uh, but this also uh, tackles the advertising and marketing to make sure that the uh, front end, the brand of the company is also looking at uh, portraying women and men in modern, authentic and multi-dimensional roles and not in very traditional roles um, as we've seen in the past. And I think that there's a lot of progression here. Um, and I think from, from the procurement um, perspective, there is a lot of things that could be done. Um, I personally witnessed a, a project in, in South Africa where um, the hotel uh, and the chef in the hotel brought in local rural women into uh, to the marketplace and um, they showed them what the, the company, uh, the hotel would want uh, from, from these farmer women. Uh, 
and the the women had been giving them um i can't remember what the produce was but let's say uh potatoes and in fact the hotel would pay much more money for uh, mashed potatoes something that had been processed um, and uh, that would be a win-win situation. So those dialogues that were fostered between the hotel and the chef at the hotel and the farmer women um, in, in the rural areas fostered this kind of collaboration that was a win-win for both uh, sides, both the company and the women uh, often living in, in poverty. Um, so there are many opportunities here to, to look outside the box and see how can the company benefit the local community? How can these women and, and um, men be brought in to, to the, the service uh, with enhanced products? Um, and um, so this is where uh, we have designed products and services for women, for women and girls, but also with women to engage them and see what opportunities there are for collaboration in the local community. Um, principle six is that uh, engagement at the local community, and this is also to establish brand awareness, um, and that uh, could foster um, future talent uh, to be attracted to the company. It can be um, engaging, as we heard from um, Jocelyn earlier, uh, that can create business opportunities and collaboration. Um, so there are many opportunities in, in that uh, engaging in the local community. Finally, I think my, my time is up, Lucy. <laughs> um, principle seven is very, very important. Uh, this is where you track uh, the progress, make sure that uh, your action plan that you put in place has very good um, performance indicators so that you can track progress over time. Uh, and that's the only way that you could also justify the uh, resources that you spend on putting in place an action plan uh, to be able to show where, where you're heading. So I will stop here and I'm really looking forward to the group work um, and to listen in and, and see how uh, we can create uh, a gender uh, responsive tourism sector. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, Anna. That was really useful and I think a very good overview of the women's empowerment principles for those who are not familiar. We'll be sharing all the links to the key resources that are available for you, including to the gender inclusive guidelines for the tourism strategy for the tourism sector. Now we're going to move on and do some work in smaller groups. We have organized the groups more or less based on your answers from the questionnaire, more or less around, uh, where, for, for a start, whether you have already signed the women's empowerment principles or not. So group one is for those, those companies that have not yet signed the women's empowerment principles. Group two are those, I, I hope that you have more or less signed the women's empowerment principles and you're some way on your journey. And then group three is for those who have answered that, yes, we've signed the women's empowerment principles and we have lots of initiatives. So that's more or less how the groups are organized based on your responses to the questionnaire. So you will receive an invitation to the group. The groups will be moderated, I'm pleased to say. So you will have a moderator with you, either from UN Women or from the center stage team. They will introduce themselves once you get into the rooms. So you will be shared, your moderator will share a Google document, which we'd like you all to open, please. And in that document, you will find some brief questions for discussion. We ask you to talk about what are the successes that you've managed to achieve so far in terms of gender equality and women's empowerment in your company. And what kinds of challenges are you currently facing? And then you will find some some of the materials from the, from the recently produced guidelines, the Gender Inclusive Tourism Strategy. And uh, what you will find in there is some tables, which, which are an action plan. From that action plan, then you will be asked to choose one of the thematic areas that you can find in the report. So it's either employment, entrepreneurship, leadership, community and civil society, 
education or uh, measurement for better policies. You'll have all the information there. And you can see we've created some examples of how you can fill out those action plans. And we just ask each company in the second part of the exercise, we ask each company to choose one area where you think you can have the most impact and just complete one line of the table. So the moderators will share the documents with you in the group and they will also lead you through the discussions. We're going to have around 30 minutes for these to complete this activity. So there should be time for you to introduce yourselves, uh, get to know each other a little bit and the moderator and have a look at the materials. I will also share with you the, the broader strategy document so that you can see how, how it fits within the broader picture. And then the part when we're working in groups will not be recorded. So that will, can be an informal discussion and confidential. What we do ask you to do, please, is choose one person from your group to make a summary of your discussion and then present back. And we will come back to the recording and we'll record those summaries of the, of the group discussions. So one person per group to take some notes and present back. Hello, everybody. Welcome back from the group discussion. Thank you for being with us still if you're watching us on YouTube. So I'm going to start with group one, who were the group who have made kind of uh, less progress so far on their WEPS journey. And that will be presented by Mohammed. Mohammed, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. It's a pleasure. So uh, I will go quickly on the documents that we just created. So uh, in the beginning, we were uh, discussing, like we're discussing what were the achievements that we have so far. So we are gladly say that we have managed to have an effective board of 80% uh, women compared to 20% men. Uh, we have increased the workforce gradually since our inception, like we were established 10 years ago, and now we are running at 40% women have been employed into the company. And on the C level, uh, we have one woman and one gentleman. So that's our structure and achievement when it comes to the women empowerment and the, uh, uh, the percentages between men and women in our organization. Uh, our company as well as yet to see the small medium enterprise with, uh, with around 21 employees over there. On the other hand as well, we have facing a couple of challenges uh, which was uh, highlighted in the effectiveness of the decision-making process. Uh, secondly, the empowerment level and its consequences. Certainly, uh, the sustainability, succession, and the temporary gaps fulfillment that we have from a couple of we have faced during the last decade when I had a couple of team members in a specific department that we left for maternity uh, leave, and how we managed to over, overcome this challenge, and what are the other challenges as well that we still have a challenge in overcoming them. Uh, I would say the, the one uh, thematic area that we need to improve is going to be the leadership and the policy decision making. And we have come with an action plan for it that with the objective of implementing it more of a training, properly as well, like other training and implementation of corporate governance and the possibility of hiring a board of advisors. Budget is going to be agreed on and a timeline between a year to two. Uh, and the responsible staff for it will be a couple from the board, uh, myself and our CTO. Lastly, like the objective of fostering the gender evaluation criteria, uh, this one as well, we are going to expand, expand the evaluation criteria to include different metrics, uh, which will be more or less as well, I would say, uh, outsourced to us, uh, our company. Uh, responsibility over here between myself and Marwan and our CTO. Then we will start having a reporting and data tracking. So we can have a prompt evaluation process at the same time, fair, uh, fair criteria, so there is no any kind of bias. Thank you so much to Group 1 for participating in that and for completing those tables so clearly. I'll pass on to Group 2. It's Michaela who's feeding back. Would you like me to share the document on my screen? Oh, that would be great. Okay. So they discussed the same questions and completed the same activity. Yeah, so I, I can start talking in terms of achievements and successes. Um, uh, the global leadership team or senior leadership team is 62% female and 34% male. 
uh, and our SWOT team is 50-50. Um, something that we're proud of is the empowerment of the local farmers group in Mangas Village in uh, Indonesia, uh, where we created a business skills course uh, over a, a eight week period and we got them certified uh, for making uh, organic massage oil. Um, so we had experts from um, uh, organic companies to come and assess them. Uh, and uh, we had to really influence the, the village chief to let the, the women uh, do this. And they were very excited and uh, he was very supportive in the end and also gave them a piece of land where they could uh, grow organic crops and sell to the hotels that we uh, contract with. So they have their own kind of income stream. Um, we put in measuring tool in our system so we can measure tour guide percentage of how many jobs are given. Um, so now that the borders are open, we will be able to measure that this year. It's exciting. And then uh, we created women owned enterprises as part of our women in travel product uh, range and also did child safe uh, training. Um, Hanan uh, created a program only for women to get prepared to uh, management roles and um, aiming to raise uh, women participation to 20% in 2025, and also create the latest committee development plans, uh, mentorship programs, uh, and either uh, community um, projects there that you can see, which is fantastic. And then for challenges, um, we talked about recruitment uh, for the DMC, some of the roles that we have, uh, we only get male applicants, and we're a little bit culturally challenged on that because in a lot of our countries, women should not be drivers, for example. Um, but we really want them to be drivers so we have more of a diverse range. So it's a good challenge to have. So we will battle that this year. Um, and, um, what's the other one? and then also through our supply chain, how we kind of measure that they are at our level at like meeting our values and what we expect of ourselves. We wanna make sure that our preferred suppliers in tier one for hotels are at that same level. So we've created a form and we, we're just finding a challenge kind of how we're gonna measure it and what conversations do we have to have if it comes back and it's not good. Um, Hanan uh, and Sinam, I think we have similar like cultural um, challenges where the jobs in hospitality or tourism seem like not a job for ladies. Uh, so it's hard for us to create that diverse uh, workplace or a diverse uh, talent pool of people uh, because of the uh, cultural views of perhaps the roles. So um, we wanted to focus on, uh, I think we all picked something here. Here we go. Uh, in entrepreneurship, encourage more women in, to start their own travel business, um, having more workshops and inviting them uh, to learn um, the expenses of the workshop. And then the indicators would be um, counting uh, the success, I guess, of those uh, entrepreneurships that comes out of those workshops. And uh, training programs with KPIs, uh, measurements, 20% of females as general, uh, six months to graduate, um, measuring the assignments and mentorships, and building uh, cap capacities and capabilities for women to access decision-making positions. And then mine was around the recruitment there for measurement, uh, improving the percentage of applicants across Discover, and collecting data why we only have male applicants to seeing how we can chip away at that. Um, and we have very great female in our company in roles that probably are considered male roles in this um, area of, of the world. Uh, so we think if we could do a promo video of the career, but we having these women talk about the career, then that would really promote that you can do it. And they have climbed the ranks to get there as well. Uh, so we really want to do that. And that we think it might be a cost to that because we need someone professional, not with an iPhone to do it. Um, yeah. And the measurement would be the percentage of increase of female hires in, in those areas. Thank you so much to Michaela and her colleagues for uh, developing this excellent presentation. We've really clear when you set it out into these tables exactly how these actions can be implemented. So thank you for doing that. 
And finally, last but not least, I'll pass to group three, which are those who have made most progress so far in implementing their WEPs. And I will pass to for the presentation to Rana Mahendru, Rama Mahendru from Intrepid Travel Peak DMC in India. Would you like me to share the screen, Rama? Let's share the document. Yeah. So uh, like we discussed the achievement and successes, so uh, Fijian from uh, Jordan, when she started in this male-dominated company, she was the only employee. And gradually, the, uh, she can see the more women working in tourism. So uh, I'm from India and in Interpret Travel. So what we did in uh, Interpret Travel, so we are the small group adventure travel company with the vision that uh, changing the way we see the world. And our style has be, always been to travel with a local way, small group with a local leader and use the local uh, neighborhood restaurants so that the approach is to ensure authentic experiences and means more money generated through the tourism stays where it belongs. So uh, in terms of key successes, like our commitment to gender equality comes uh, from an inherent belief that diversity and inclusion makes our business strong and ensure that we are realizing our talent pool. So uh, our, like we have looked very closely our people data to show where the opportunities are and to set the goals. So currently our board of directors is the one third woman and we have almost equal gender split in our global leadership teams. So a few years ago, we noticed that uh, our most of the offices, like we have 26 DMCs across the globe. So they have lots of female staff working in all the offices, but we were having very much lower number of uh, tour leaders, female tour leaders. So in 2017, we set a goal to double our female uh, tour leaders and in 2020 we reached uh, like our goal six months early growing from 153 in February to 314 female leaders by June 20. So when we like in India when we got applications from uh, females we had to create so many awareness sessions with the universities and uh, we had that information that they needed a approval from parents. So we, in that case, we had to call their parents just to assure them that uh, your uh, girl will be safe with us. We have a trusted uh, partners, which we have trusted suppliers. So we can guarantee on the uh, safety on the roads. And also we are creating a very healthy work environment in the offices as well to support as a tour leader because it's a, again, a male dominated uh, role and uh, non-traditional, you can say, the uh, job opportunities. But I think that uh, training sessions in the universities that created more awareness. Also, uh, considering all angles uh, within the business to make changes, we have uh, investigated wh whether we have a gender pay gap, which we don't, we have also committed to equal gender representation through our spokespersons and storytellers. So in 2020, it was 62% female. So we consider gender as a market opportunity. As well. So like around 65% of our customers are female. So we have launched women's expeditions, which is all female travelers with, guided by a female uh, tour leader. So Initially, we started with Jordan, Iran, and Morocco, but due to its uh, popularity, we launched uh, for Nepal, India, Turkey, and Kenya in 2019. So growing from just four departures to 36 departures in a matter of months. So these have been among the fastest selling trips in uh, the Interpret's history. Also, uh, our fundraising efforts like Interpret Foundation, also supports women-focused projects, particularly related to skill training and economic empowerment. We are also furthering our knowledge in the ways gender is intersecting with the climate change and looking at the opportunities to support efforts where they overlap. 
Um, lastly, I think we are starting work to examine our supply chain to identify opportunities to support more female-owned businesses as we have set a goal to work with our 200 suppliers by 2025. So like we take a holistic approach for uh, two women's employment and empowerment at each In terms of challenges, uh, like we discussed, uh, it's uh, again, uh, people think that tourism industry is inappropriate for women. And uh, uh, we are also facing at a country level, like there is a perception family, there are so many family obligations, societal expectations that women won't work outside the home, travel or irregular work hours, which can be a part of the job. So lack of access to educational opportunities and language training is also an issue. Uh, what else challenges uh, we discussed at a business level, like there can be a lack of commitment and understanding of gender equality. So business need to realize that by having gender equality in the business, we are creating more stronger and more competitive. So businesses uh, can see the potential having uh, more females in the business. In terms of uh, action plan, like we discussed about that we will focus on entrepreneurship. We should increase more uh, women-led businesses in the tourism and uh, what actions we will take by having a corporate internship, uh, women participation in mentorship, we'll promote education, enhance collaboration among private sectors, create uh, financial support, entry to the new mar markets. Uh, and timeline we are seeing, I think, uh, one year as minimum for each activity, but I think it will be a long-term um, goal. It will take at least five years to achieve the whole supply chain. Okay, thank you so much to everybody for your participation. Thank you for the excellent presentations, for the really good detail that you've managed to capture and that we've now managed to share here um, across a broader audience for YouTube. Thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate your time and very, as well your insights. Every time we do one of these, we get a little bit closer yeah, on our journey of understanding better the barriers for women and the opportunities for women in the tourism sector, especially in the more in-depth context in a country level and in specific companies. We really appreciate your insights. The contact details here for the WEPS team, if you'd like to know more about the women's empowerment principles, if you're not already a signatory, find out how to do that. And also for the centre stage project, you have the contact details there. So from my side, I'd like to thank all of you for participating, Jocelyn and Anna for their excellent presentations, the moderators, Shivangi, Teresa and Daniela, and everybody who is watching and joining us on YouTube. So I'll just pass to Ben to close officially on behalf of UNWTA. Thanks very much, Lucy, and thank you to everyone. That's been really, really interesting hearing uh, your feedback. I'll also be giving the floor uh, to Anna, uh, Anna Felt, who's still with us from our, our good partners, UN Women. But just to um, to reiterate my thanks, uh, especially, and to say thank you to Lucy uh, and all of the moderators for today's session, but primarily to yourselves uh, out there in the tourism businesses for all of the work that you're doing uh, and for sharing with us today. To everybody who's watching on YouTube, we hope that this has been a useful uh, for you. Uh, you can find more information, uh, I'm sure Anna will tell you now, on, on the, the webs on the Women's Empowerment Principles on their website. And on the UNWTO eLibrary, you can find all of our publications related to this, specifically the Gender Inclusive Strategy for Tourism business Businesses. So a final thank you to the partners of the Centre Stage Project, the German Federal Ministry for Economic uh, Development and Cooperation. Um, uh, the German Agency for International Cooperation, and thanking you and women, I shall pass over for the final words to uh, Anna Felf. Uh, Anna, please. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Ben, and thanks for for every to everyone for joining this conversation. I saw in the chat that there's some interest to continue, 
the conversations. And I would just want to say that it was fascinating to hear about your initiatives, how you're engaging uh, and, and really trying to achieve gender equality within the, the workplace, but also in the community and in the, in the value chain. So congrats to everyone for, for efforts. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. And I think we, we want to capture these stories. We have a feature on our website uh, that we call Community Insights. And we welcome all of you to, to contribute as a, as a web signatory to this space and share what the, the great uh, innovations that you're doing and the way um, it, it would help other companies to, to also understand what they can do what the roadblocks are and how you kind of overcome them and, and thinking through um, how to, why do you only get male applications for certain jobs? And I think it's a great idea to come up with a, a video to, to really show that women can be in these jobs too and vice versa, uh, where you see that there are too many women, how can we uh, get more men into those roles? So it is trying to give everyone the equal opportunities to, to flourish in, um, in, in their jobs. So um, happy to hear from all of you. And I'm sure with you and WTO, we'll continue uh, to collaborate and, and uh, we'll have these kind of sessions again. But feel free to reach out to us. And, and thanks to the UN Women colleagues as well that helped with the facilitation and, 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 and the presentation. And to all of you for joining and taking the time to think through the gender equality agenda. Thank you so much.